Hello everyone and welcome to Clean Technica's second broadcast of our new news show. For everyone that did not see our first broadcast, the intention of this new show is to help you deal with informational overload out there. And so we aim to keep our episodes at under 20 minutes. Now, um, any news that can be summarized under in a couple of sentences will be, and those that need extra context will get a deeper dive. Now, we want to keep this a balanced news show, so in the weeks that there is too much Tesla news, we will actually make that a separate clip. And I know last time I said we aim to publish these on Friday from now on, and that is still our intention. Wasn't possible this time, but hopefully next week. So, let's get to the news. Lucid Motors This week we start off with EV news, and in particular we're starting with the Lucid Air. You see, Lucid Motors was planning to unveil the production version of their air vehicle at the New York Auto Show this week. However, since the New York Auto Show was cancelled, so was the unveiling. Because of this, there are also rumors going around that production has been delayed, but those are just rumors, no official comment. In any case, um, before... Just recently, they published a new clip where they show how their Lucid Air beta prototype can easily go more than 400 miles or 640 kilometers before needing to recharge. And in the clip, they take the prototype from uh, San Francisco to LA and then back. Rivian. In pretty similar news, Rivian announced that they had to shut down all their operations and temporarily halt the construction of their factory. However, they did share an interesting video, which is a status update of what things were like in February, before everything went into lockdown. The link to the full video is down in the description below. Volkswagen One of the cheapest EVs on the market, the Volkswagen E-Up, is suddenly very popular. Volkswagen reports that in the first three months of 2020, in Germany, 50% of all up sales were E-Ups, and that's 20,000 orders right there. And on a personal note, in the Netherlands, I've also been seeing a lot more e-ups lately. So this is not just Germany. In a different blog post where Volkswagen was talking about all kinds of different things, one thing really stood out. Frank Blom, who is uh, Volkswagen's head of battery cell division, revealed uh, what their ba uh, battery warranty will be like for their upcoming vehicles. The company guarantees that after eight years of use, the battery capacity won't be lower than 70% of what it originally was. However, that warranty only counts if the vehicle has driven less than 160,000 kilometers, which is roughly 100,000 miles. And that's not a lot. Throughout their lifetime, most cars will drive a lot more than that. Hell, Tesla's talking about the million-mile drivetrain. I mean, that's like 10 times more than that, even. I mean, this is something I might have expected from two, a 2012 Nissan Leaf, but not from the latest and greatest electric vehicle from Volkswagen like the ID3. That same blog post also mentioned some pretty well-intended recycling plans. However, as always, they didn't mention how they plan to get back those batteries and make sure that they don't end up on a junkyard. BYD This week, BYD announced their new fire and explosion-resistant blade battery. Now, um, anytime an EV catches fire, it's front page news. And the reason for that is actually pretty backwards. It's because it's so rare. You see, gas cars, they explode on a daily basis all over the world, and so it's nothing new. And so that's why it never really makes the news. So, nonetheless, even though batteries are safer, there's always room for improvement. And that's where BYD's new blade battery comes in. Apparently, their new batteries, they can be punctured, crushed, bent. Uh, they can be overcharged by 260%. They can be heated in an oven up to 300 degrees Celsius, which is 572 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's just crazy. Just to note, none of these things cause the battery to catch fire or to explode. That doesn't mean that the battery is still operational or safe to use. It's not like an engine check light is going to come on, or in this case a battery check light if we were still in the 90s, uh, would come on and that you can just drive it to the garage to get it fixed. At this point, that's not the case anymore, but it's still mighty impressive that it didn't catch fire or explode. And sadly, BYD did not explain how they managed to accomplish this, because I sure would love to know. In any case, the first BYD model that will get the blade battery is a model called Han, which is scheduled to go for sale in June. It'll have a range of 605 kilometers, which is 376 miles, and it will be able to accelerate from 0 to 100 kilometers, or from 0 to 60 miles, in just 3.9 seconds. 
So an interesting detail about this is that BYD also plans to form partnerships with other companies to implement their new blade battery technology. Now, a uh, few days, four days after this announcement, BYD announced uh, that they are starting a joint venture with Toyota for R&D of electric vehicles. Now, while the timing of this announcement is a bit suspect, it is yet to be confirmed whether Toyota is one of the companies that is interested in the blade battery. Fossil fuels. Equinor, formerly known as Statoil, is a Norwegian energy company that operates in more than 30 countries worldwide. Now, in today's news, they have announced that they are leaving the IPAA, which stands for the Independent Petroleum Association of America, which is a fossil fuel lobbying group in the US. Now, the reason that they have decided to leave the IPAA is because the organization doesn't have a climate change policy and does not support the Paris Climate Accords. It's interesting how European fossil fuel companies are at least acknowledging climate change, you know, and uh, the fact that they're creating some kind of plans to diversify into the renewable energy sector, unlike all the others that are based in the US and other places in the, in the world, like, for example, Australia. Equinor is still staying with the American Petroleum Institute, the API, as well as the Australian Petroleum Production and Exploration Association, APPEA. You will not believe how many times it took me to get that right. Um, in any case, it, Equinor is staying with those because they're a bit more open-minded and Equinor believes that they might be able to persuade him to take a more climate-friendly stance. Hey, it's a step in the right direction. What can I say? Biology. Last week, we had a synthetic biology piece. Now, this week, we again have a biology piece, but there's nothing synthetic about it. So, this week's piece is about bacteria that eat hard, toxic plastic. Now, in the 60s, the approach to plastic was that it's like the salvation for everything. And while it's still pretty, really useful today, um, disposing of it has become a real nuisance. And it's a bit of a running joke. I mean, everyone has this plastic bag full of plastic bags somewhere at home. And... Uh, really, there are a bunch of problems that come to disposing of plastic, and they stem into a couple different directions. One direction is all the microplastic that falls off of plastic items, or, for example, the microplastic fibers that uh, go into the sewage system each time you wash clothes like made of stuff like polyester. Then another direction has to do with landfills and trash in the ocean and everywhere else. So plastic will naturally take between 10 and 1,000 years to decompose. And, for example, we're talking about 10 to 20 years for a thin, thin plastic bag, uh, about 500 years for a plastic bottle uh, for, of Coke or water or whatever, and then up to 1,000 years for a hard plastic toy or a hard plastic garden chair or something like that. And this is an enormous problem that we have not yet solved. The hard plastic, the hard toxic plastic is the most difficult of all. In the last 10 years, however, the situation has improved dramatically. While still far from perfect, a lot of good practices and laws have been introduced, or better said, forced upon society. Uh, things like good recycling programs, a ban on free plastic bags, uh, inventions like uh, compostable plastics based off of materials like corn, and a lot more. However, there are two big problems that have still remained elusive. Uh, one would be stricter laws on packaging. So there are two things here. First of all, there is a needless variation of plastic out there. There's different, like in, for packaging, there are like 60 different types of plastic and that with laws can easily be reduced to five. That way, recycling will be a lot easier. Uh, then the other problem has to do how packaging where the plastic is sometimes glued or attached to paper and is difficult to separate. So people will either uh, not bother because it's too difficult or they will throw it away and cause impurities in the recycling process. The other big elusive problem out there today has to do with recycling this toxic hard plastic, which is rarely done because it's very difficult to do or not worthwhile from an expense standpoint. Uh, then there's also the fact that we need to try to recycle not only all this hard plastic, but plastic in general that has already gone into landfills around the world and doing all of this without producing additional greenhouse gases. A long time ago, people already thought, hey, wouldn't it be nice if a bacteria would just eat all of the plastic and solve all our problems? And ever since, this has basically been the holy grail of plastic decomposition. And as a matter of fact, a lot of significant progress has been made on this front. 
In 2016, a bacteria was discovered in a Japanese waste dump that appears to be eating uh, the type of plastic that we use in plastic bottles. And then later, in uh, 2018, the enzyme that that bacteria used was isolated. And hopefully, within a couple of years, we can actually start using that enzyme in um, some kind of recycling factory to decompose plastic. Now, however, in a different waste site, one presumably located in Germany, because that's where this research team is from, a bacteria has been discovered that can break down polyurethane, which is uh, the scientific term for the hard plastic that we mentioned earlier. Now, a lot of work has yet to be done, like, for example, isolating the enzyme in this bacteria that breaks down the plastic. But it's a really fascinating discovery, and it really raises our hopes that we will be able to solve this huge plastic problem out there. Tesla. So we have two stories this week, and we're starting off with batteries in Hawaii. Hawaii Electric is planning on building a huge battery project made up of 244 Tesla Megapacks. That amounts to a whopping 732 megawatt hours. And if you remember that enormous Tesla project in South Australia uh, called the Hornsdale Battery Reserve, well, that originally was only 129 megawatt hours, and even now with its upgrade, it's only 185 megawatt hours, which is nothing in comparison to what Hawaii is currently planning. In addition to the 244 Tesla Megapacks, Hawaii Electric uh, proposes a 135 megawatt hour uh, battery installation in Kahe, a 65 megawatt hour installation at the Campbell Industrial Park, a uh, 40 megawatt hour system in Maui and uh, two systems on the island of Hawaii uh, with a total capacity of 18 megawatt hours. And when you add that all up together, you get 990 megawatt hours. Not quite a gigawatt hour, but pretty darn close. Hawaii Electric, well played. The state of Hawaii has set itself a goal of getting 100% of all their electricity from renewable sources by 2045. Now, with this project, they're well underway, but what none of the other articles go into is, according to 2018 numbers, Hawaii uses 25.6 gigawatt hours of electricity per day. Now, you need at least a fourth of that as battery storage for electricity needs in the morning, in the evening, and at night. Now, um, while I'm sure they could get there by 2045 without any problems, the rest of the US and the rest of the world, that's a whole different matter. And by the same type of calculations, the US would need something like 2,650 gigawatt hours. And the whole world would need something like 16,000 gigawatt hours. And it's actually far from impossible. Uh, I would recommend you guys read my article, Elon Musk Talks Terawatt Hours, We Run Some Numbers. I mean, this is just such a fascinating subject. I started spiraling down again into the rabbit hole of calculations, trying to figure out how and what. And I really shouldn't go into more details in the new show, uh, but... I will definitely make a separate video about this someday. Now for the second Tesla story, Elon Musk was again caught talking about a HVAC system for homes that he wants to make one. I mean, at this point, he should just start the building company, seriously. I mean, they already have free bricks from their tunneling projects. They manufacture roofs, they manufacture power walls, and now they also want to start manufacturing HVAC systems? I mean, at this point, you know, a home built entirely by an Elon Musk company is starting to sound too good to be true. Elon is pretty good at making use of advantages to make things possible that weren't possible before. Uh, the way, for example, rocket reusability enabled Starlink. Uh, the same way the boring company and their free bricks can enable uh, Elon to make the building company. Anywhere that the boring company is building tunnels, the building company can also operate. As a matter of fact, I think that they should start by making an entire neighborhood in Reno, Nevada, where the Nevada Gigafactory is located. Because the housing issue there is just, it's no joke, and it has really uh, hampered their efforts of hiring more people. I mean, think about it. Facebook has Menlo Park, Google has the Google Village, and now Tesla can have um, the boring place, uh, Terra Tesla, New Betelgeese, uh, Beetlejuice, New Beetle... You know, nobody's sure, certain how to pronounce that. Actually, I'm sure Elon would love to prank people like that, naming it in a place that no one can pronounce. In any case, um, suggest your best idea down in the comments and let's see what's most popular. To get back on topic, I'm sure Tesla could do all kinds of useful experiments in a neighborhood like this, like learning how to combine full self-driving with um, infrastructure. 
where uh, to place uh, the pickup zones, the drop-off zones, how many, what they need to look like. Uh, or for example, they could uh, make Autopilot intimately familiar with this neighborhood and the route to the Gigafactory and start driving their employees to work and back home and in the process getting tons of uh, full self-driving uh, robotaxi fleet experience. Then, uh, I don't know, they could, for example, also test for Starlink, how uh, lots of the receivers work in close proximity. Now, I don't know if that's really necessary or not, but I'm sure that Elon and his fleet of engineers can come up with tons of uses for this. Anyways, that was the news for this week. Make sure to tune in again next time. Did you like this video and do you think more people should see it? Then please give this video a thumbs up. Make sure you're subscribed and if you press that bell icon down below, you will get a notification next time we post a video. You'll be one of the first to see it. Then um, we were planning on posting this on Friday. That didn't happen this time again. We will make sure to try to do that next week and it will be posted around the same time as this one. Other than that, I wish you guys a wonderful weekend and till next time. See ya.